Good afternoon. I am Celeste Watkins Hayes, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the University of Michigan Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy and founding director of the Center for Racial Justice. Housed at the Ford School, the Center for Racial Justice is a cross-disciplinary space that aims to foster deep relationships between research and advocacy to uncover the voices of the unjustly silenced, challenge us to live up to our democratic ideals, and offer sound policy prescriptions for a more equitable and just society. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Ford School's annual event in honor of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Featuring today, U.S. Deputy Secretary of Commerce, Don Graves. Mr. Graves' efforts as a champion for inclusive economic development are especially fitting with our goals here at the Center for Racial Justice to harness public policy as a tool of racial equity and to spotlight the voices of the change makers who are doing this critical work. Deputy Secretary has decades of experience in the private sector, government, and nonprofits, through which he has been dedicated to ensuring that economic opportunity is inclusive and broad-based. He has a demonstrated history as a champion for community development, including leadership in the federal government's efforts in the economic recovery of the, of the city of Detroit under President Obama. Don Grace also has a rich family history connected to the Commerce Department. His four times great grandparents built a successful horse and buggy taxi business in Washington that once stood at the site of the department's headquarters. And their son went on to own a premier hotel just blocks away and become one of our nation's first black patent holders. We'll hear more about that later. Today's event reflects the theme for the University of Michigan's 2022 MLK Junior Symposium, This is America, which explores the many images of America as defined and interpreted through history, popular culture, and present day events, juxtaposing an idealized version vision of America with some of the harsh realities using the teachings and observations of Dr. King as a lens. In doing so, This is America challenges all of us to do our part to transform this country into a community that we want to be, want it to be, and purport it to be. This conversation will be moderated by my colleague, Michael Barr, Dean of the Ford School and faculty director of one of the event's co-sponsors, the U of M Center for Finance, Law, and Policy. We encourage you to ask questions in the YouTube chat box or tweet your questions to hashtag policy talks. There will be time at the end of the live event for these audience questions, including those received in advance. With that, I ask you to join me in welcoming the 19th Deputy Secretary of Commerce, Don Graves, and my colleague and our Dean at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, Michael Barr. Thanks so much, Celeste, for that great introduction. Uh, Secretary Graves, my friend, it is just wonderful to have you here at the Ford School for Martin Luther King Day. Dean Barr, it is, uh, it is so good to be with you on this day of celebration, reflection, and service, uh, and to have this conversation uh, about equity and inclusion, which was at the core of everything uh, that, uh, that Dr. King uh, fought for his entire life. Uh, that's that's just uh, so true. You know, uh, I was thinking this morning that you and I started working together about a quarter of a century ago. Um, you started out your professional career as a community organizer when we first met. And uh, I wonder if you could, you know, reflect on that. You, you share that background with, with President Obama. That's not a bad uh, uh, way of starting out your career to share with uh, with with uh, Barack Obama the origin uh, story. Uh, how do you think that shaped your subsequent career in the treasury and the White House and the private sector and now running this vast organization? Well, at, at, at 
at the core, what it's helped me to do is better understand people and communities. If, if you don't have that knowledge, that touch point, if you can't see how people are living, the challenges that they face every day, the opportunities that we have uh, in those communities, how are you going to, to develop a good and effective public policy? How can you ensure that, uh, that your nonprofit organization is actually serving the needs of the community? How can you uh, make sure that your business is, uh, is tailored to the needs of your consumers, that it's a responsive uh, uh, public, uh, excuse me, uh, corporate citizen? So for me, it's allowed me to better understand the, the, what I'm driving at, the ways that, that we can be uh, better stewards of the American tax dollar uh, and, and effectuate good public policy. So it must be hard. I mean, how do, you, how do you integrate the voices of communities, of community activists into the work you do at the Commerce Department? You're you know, the number two official at this vast organization. You're sitting in Washington. It, it's very easy to get removed from that. So how do you think about bringing those voices into the work that you do now? It's, 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 that's a, a really great question. Um, one of the things that a, a lot of people, they think about the Commerce Department, uh, and if they don't know all the different, the 13 different bureaus that we have here, they, they may think, oh, it's the Department of Business or the Department of uh -huh. Industry. They, you know, they, they focus on CEOs. And frankly, uh, nothing could be further from the truth in a lot of ways. Yes, we work with businesses we work with, with, with corporations to make sure that the economy uh, is growing and works for all Americans, but we're really the department of people and communities. We, are, uh, we have some of the, the, we have the largest number of scientists or close to it in the entire federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the best data uh, in the federal government with the Census Bureau, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, um, we have National Institutes of Standards and Technologies, mm -hmm. the Patent and Trademark Office, so many different parts of, uh, of, of government that are focused on data and the impact on communities actually resides at the Department of Commerce. So when the secretary and I think about our work, it has to be rooted in, uh, in people, in communities, the effect that uh, policies, not just from commerce, but across government have on those communities. And the only way that I know to, uh, to really have that work that we're doing rooted in communities is to have that connection with communities and making sure that, uh, that not only are we talking with communities and talking with the, the, those who help bring voice to the voiceless, as, as Dr. King would have said, um, which includes nonprofits and, and advocacy organizations, but it's also making sure that the people who populate this department represent the broad diversity of our country. It's something that the president has spent a lot of time focusing on. In fact, uh, the, the very first set of executive orders he signed were to drive uh, diversity and inclusion and broad-based equity. And the way that we do that is to make sure that, that people who sit in these positions like mine and others across the department and, and across government actually, uh, as I said, reflect that diversity, but as importantly, also have the lived experiences of the folks uh, we represent ac across this country. It, it's, it's one thing to sort of get it from, a, from an academic uh, perspective, as, as you know, but it's a whole different matter to actually spend time in a community, understanding uh, what people are going through, having relatives who are dealing with with challenges. So, part of our part of the thing that we're doing, and I know you've done this throughout your career, uh, uh, Dean Barr, is to make sure that that we are very connected with people, that with communities, and that uh, that the perspectives that they had are reflected in the work that we're doing. That uh, that's uh, really wonderful to see, you know, again, somebody at the very top of the Commerce Department with that set of values and mission being so clearly articulated. I know it makes a big difference to the work the department is doing. You, you mentioned Dr. King's approach of, of giving voice to the voiceless. And 
uh, we have a, a lovely couple, Hal and Carol Cohn, who have just uh, provided support to the Ford School to do precisely that uh, through a new collaborative for social policy and, and with that same ethos in mind. I, I wonder, Don, um, whether, uh, if you don't mind, um, if you would talk a little bit about your family. Um, the title of uh, our activities today at the university for MLK Day is This is America. And that's a phrase that is meant to explore all the contradictions inherent in the American story. Uh, the tug and pull of values both upheld and dashed. Um, and in many ways, your own personal family history going back now generations embodies that theme. You, so, as Celeste Watkins Hayes said, uh, former enslaved men and women who became owners of their own business on the site where the Commerce Department is now. Um, your family's relationship with Frederick Douglass. Uh, you, and I, you and I were looking at his um, home on the Chesapeake Bay last summer. What does that journey of your family uh, mean for you today? So maybe take, take some time really to tell the story to our audience, because I think it's sure. a powerful story about the complexity of the American experience. It, 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 I think you're right. The, the, the American story is very complex. Uh, and I, I know it's easy for, uh, for uh, uh, media and for uh, the storybooks to try and portray things in one direction or another. Um, but uh, I use my family story as a touch point for the work that, that I do. Uh, I, it's, it's sort of poignant for me every single day for me to, uh, to come into the building and walk on the very land that my ancestors owned and operated a business and on which they lived and, and toiled and shed blood and tears. Um, the, my four times great grandparents uh, were able, fortunate enough to, uh, to be freed slaves who ran that, that business, started a business and were able to be successful with the business. And then their son, uh, his name was James Wormley, was able to, uh, to start his own business, building off of the business of his own parents, just like so many uh, in the, the American story uh, that we've seen over the course of history. Uh, you pass on the opportunity, you pass on uh, a business uh, or some skills. And so he took that business and turned it into uh, a, a set of essentially uh, a small bed and breakfast, if you will, boarding houses, uh, eventually building up enough of, of a business that he was able to, uh, to own and operate a hotel in the, the mid to late 1800s. And the story, the storybooks uh, don't usually tell you about these African-Americans who in those days were actually quite successful and I think would be uh, considered, uh, you know, millionaires today based mm -hmm. on, uh, on, uh, on uh, and, and, you know, you look at, you look at, at uh, what they were, their worth back then. He built that, that hotel and he served the, the generals of the day of, uh, of in the civil war, the senators and members of, of Congress and, and presidents. And uh, it's, it's, not lost on me that the very agreement that ended Reconstruction in the South and ushered in decades of Jim Crow and the escalation of violence against African Americans and other minorities, the systemic intimidation and eventual disenfranchisement of, of Black voters, that agreement was actually crafted in the hotel, in the parlor, uh, owned and operated uh, by my three times great uh, grandfather, the, it's, and it's it's actually called the Wormley Compromise or the Wormley Agreement. Mm -hmm. he, he was a man who who was a confidant and caretaker to all of these leaders in the country, and by by at least uh, some accounts of the day, he was actually cradling Lincoln's head when he took mm -hmm. his last breath. So the 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 for me, it's uh, it's a touch point that there is huge possibility in this country that, that there, there's a chance, it may be smaller than it should be, but there's a chance that, that you can do amazing things. 
The problem is that for too long, that chance has been too small, that the, the opportunity hasn't really been available for most, uh, most Americans, certainly not for, for most African Americans and other people of color. So for me, the, the, the thing that I'm focused on is making sure that we open that aperture, that we're creating greater opportunity, that we're putting people, to, people in a position where they have the, 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 the chance to take the ideas, the dreams that they have, um, and then if we can give them just that little bit of, of opportunity, that, that possibility, they can turn those dreams into a reality and lives of dignity, because that's what everyone in this country really wants, is the opportunity to live a life of dignity. We just have to make sure that, that it's more broadly based and that the systemic challenges uh, like racism, that we're ushering those out the door, creating more, uh, more opportunity for, for the folks that have not had opportunity in the past. You now, Secretary Graves, have this opportunity that's, that's vast at the Commerce Department to try and write a new story, write a new American story of economic opportunity. What are some of the strategies or policies you've been pursuing to try and make that happen? Well, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, what the, the president has done in part uh, that and, and uh, we're uh, working obviously closely all across the administration mm -hmm. to uh, to uh, implement some of the, this work. But the American Rescue Plan, when we were dealing, when we're still dealing with uh, with the pandemic, making sure that people had the resources and support that they needed uh, to, to get by when they couldn't work. When, uh, when our economy was, uh, was really gasping uh, at the time. So implementing the American Rescue Plan. But now, uh, just uh, last month, we were able to pass the bipartisan infrastructure law. And that's mm -hmm. going to make long-term systemic changes to our communities. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people hear about roads and bridges and, and things like that. But what people may not realize, it's things like... Uh, the biggest single investment in public transit. We know that for people mm -hmm. of color and in, in especially in uh, low income communities across the country, that public transit is a huge challenge uh, for folks that are just trying to get to work or get to their doctor appointment uh, or, or get to, to school. Um, biggest investment in clean water, making sure that, and, and I know folks in, in Michigan are very aware of this issue, making sure that we're replacing our pipes uh, and our systems so that people can have this basic fundamental right of, of, of clean water. We at the Commerce Department are actually in the process of, uh, of deploying uh, more than $40 billion to make sure that we're able to do what the president has said all along of getting every household in America, every family access to, uh, to quality, high-speed, broadband in an affordable way. And I stress the affordable way because for so many folks who live in underserved communities, uh, so many folks uh, who are struggling uh, for resources, uh, the, the ability to pay for broadband, even if it's available in their community, is, is too big a challenge. So we want to make sure that we're delivering broadband, uh, that last mile uh, in, in uh, communities across the country, especially rural areas, so that we can get the broadband to the to your home, but also making sure that it's affordable and that people have have that chance to access it with quality equipment. But it goes well beyond that. As as I was saying, we're the Commerce Department is a data heavy organization, and we've been really focused on making sure that that uh, we're using our data most effectively, uh, so that we can uh, we can make better policy decisions across government and work with the state and local government, work with philanthropies so that the dollars are, uh, and the investments are actually being used most effectively at, at communities. So some of the things that we're doing are the Census Bureau uh, has its open innovation lab to try and find ways to be more creative around the ways that we use our existing data sets or look at new data. Our Data for Everyone summits, where we're finding ways to democratize data the, uh, the Opportunity Project, uh, the Good Job Challenge uh, uh, effort, our Job Quality Initiative. So there's a range of things that we're doing. 
all getting at this, the, 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 the issue of uh, reducing inequities across our system. I, I spend a lot, and I know I'm talking a lot here, but, but I get a little worked up. I, 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 I've looked at this, these issues a lot. I, I, I go back to the, the Kellogg Foundation uh, study that they did that showed that if we were able to eliminate uh, the challenges of systemic racism uh, across our, our country and across our economy, we could increase our GDP by $8 trillion. Mm. So if you take a, an, a, an economy that's, I don't know, $22, 23000000000000 trillion, I think was the, was the last uh, number I saw, that, that's, that, that takes us to, to more than $30 trillion, uh, $30 trillion economy. So that would actually have a huge impact not just on those communities that have been so disenfranchised or, and so disconnected from the economy, but it would have a, a broad-based economic impact that every American would feel. The, the other part of this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hush up and turn it back to you, the, the, the other part of this is rebalancing our economy. And we've seen this directly uh, in, in, in the, the pandemic in, in ways that I, I think um, most Americans did not realize uh, we need to rebalance our, our economy where we can value labor uh, a, a bit better, where uh, our front line, folks like our frontline workers, our caregivers, our teachers, those working in grocery stores, those driving uh, our, our goods and, and products to market and to, to our ports, that we're valuing uh, those jobs in ways that we haven't in the past. Mm-hmm. And I think that if we're creating better quality jobs, higher quality jobs. We're going to get to a place where the economy is, is going to work uh, more effectively, where we won't have the types of uh, supply chain challenges that we're having right now. And, and I think that, that uh, our economy will grow significantly. Uh, it's just a, a wonderful array of, of activities that you're undertaking. And just, again, it expresses the vastness of, of what commerce can do. I, I know in particular that uh, Secretary Graves, you've spent a lot of time in your career focused on supporting minority-owned businesses that have been shut out of the economy. And obviously, the pandemic exacerbated those disparities even more. W- what kinds of strategies have you guys been pursuing to try and address the needs of minority-owned businesses? There's a, a, a lot of things that we've been doing and that we're going to continue to do. Um, the, I know that the SBA is trying to make sure that they are more effective at um, at providing capital uh, through to especially to minority businesses. We saw uh, the challenges at the beginning of the pandemic uh, in in getting access to those funds, particularly the the uh, the the uh, programs that the SBA was implementing in the previous administration. That that those programs were were uh, were not as effective as they could have been. So SBA in particular is looking at, at capital constraints, making more dollars available uh, in ways that are more equitable. Um, also, uh, as, as Michael, as, as you, you know well, uh, we had this wonderful program, which uh, at the Treasury Department uh, called the State Small Business Credit Initiative, which uh, w- was, I think, more effective than uh, at Getting to minority communities, getting to uh, to businesses owned by minorities and, and women, uh, more so than maybe other federal programs, and we have the opportunity now to sort of supercharge that program thanks to funding from the uh, the American Rescue Plan. So Treasury is is working on that. W- one of the things that came with the bipartisan infrastructure law that that the president had touted and we got passed last month was making an agency that's part of the, the, uh, the Commerce Department, the Minority Business Development Agency, giving it statutory authority. It had been created out of an executive order and was continued uh, you know, every, every year as a result of that. But now it it's, uh, has statutory authority. It, uh, it has the weight of, of law. And it gives us the ability to work with every federal government, really the, the congressional imprimatur, to uh, to push those agencies to do more around mm-hmm. contracting, around uh, pr- the procurement, uh, at not just from the federal lens, but also when we put out dollars uh, investing in communities, 
making sure that those dollars are uh, effectively uh, going to communities and to businesses uh, all across the country, not just uh, uh, those that, that have traditionally been successful at, at getting those contracts. So it's a range of work that we're doing, uh, but there's a whole lot more that we can do. Thanks very much. I want to uh, switch gears and ask just a fun question. Uh, you and I shared a, a boyhood love of uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, that many people probably haven't heard of, but, but I love. Could you talk a little bit about what it's like now to be overseeing that agency and, and the work it's doing? Well, it's, it, it is, it, that's a fun question. Yeah, you and I both have, uh, are, are, have geeked out about NOAA uh, for a long time. What I, I don't think everyone fully appreciates with NOAA, if they've even heard about it, is the, the full range, the vastness of this wonderful bureau here at the department. Uh, the, NOAA, in addition to looking at our oceans and our atmosphere. It, it has the, the best, the highest quality data on climate in, uh, and climate impact in the entire federal government. Uh, the, the research that, that they do, the men and women of NOAA are, 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 is, is replete with, with things that, that I don't think anyone uh, would, would know uh, is available to the American public. I, one particular part of NOAA that really everyone deals with on a daily basis, and I bet you didn't, they didn't know it was part of NOAA, is the National Weather Service. Mm -hmm. uh, so in addition to providing our, uh, the, your local meteorologist at, at your, news, your new local news channel with the data that helps drive uh, your, your for local forecast, it's helping businesses make better decisions on on weather, how to make better decisions on investments around climate. Uh, uh, it's our, our NOAA Corps, which is the, uh, a, a, the, the commissioned officers that fly our hurricane hunters uh, in, into the eyes of, of storms. It's, it, they, they people are, are ships that do research uh, all across the globe to make sure that we're, we have a better understanding of uh, of our oceans and, uh, and our climate. One of the things that we've been really focused on with NOAA is, uh, is making sure that we are looking at, at these issues the, 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 uh, and, the, and the data with an equity lens, making sure that as we think about environmental justice, that we're, we are providing the, the type of, of data and then solutions to deal with climate change, change uh, from from a, an environmental justice lens, that we're we're looking at uh, finance ready planning, that we're looking at uh, at um, at the impact that our investments have with that type of a lens. We've we've had a number of of grants that are very focused on this issue. Um, I think that NOAA has put out uh, just this past fall uh, sixty million dollars to uh, historically black colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. Uh, on education in that area, but we're also holding roundtables uh, uh, across the country to look at, uh, to talk with our community partners and to look at, at these issues. So I could go on and on, but, but uh, as you said, Noah had, you and I have a, a deep love for, for Noah. And, and at some point I'm hoping, and maybe you, 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 will, uh, you can come with me to get to, uh, to our uh, research station uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Antarctica. For one, there's research stations all across the globe, uh, but I, you know, that one would I think be a, a particularly fun one to to visit. That sounds pretty amazing, uh, Secretary Graves. We're starting to get a lot of questions in from the audience, so I'm going to switch gears and and begin to ask you audience questions. One of them is from your old friend Bill Bynum, uh, who is <laughs> on the line listening. And uh, Bill is, for those who don't know, is the CEO of Hope Credit Union and affiliated organizations and. Uh, Bill is currently teaching at the Ford School um, as a Towsley policymaker in residence and is just a wonderful uh, colleague. So Bill has a question. Can you speak to the role of CDFIs in collaboration with your efforts at Commerce in advancing economic justice? Well, uh, Bill, it, uh, I'm glad to, to hear that you're, you're on. Bill Bynum is, uh, is a national treasure. Uh, and, and thank you for the, for the question. As, as Bill knows, and, and 
Dean Barr knows, uh, I've spent a good portion of my life working on, working with CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions. Um, and they are absolutely critical to our ability to ensure that, uh, that economic development, community development uh, is inclusive, that we're focused on, uh, on finding pathways to deliver um, uh, credit and capital to communities that are often left behind. And it's something that we at Commerce are also very focused on. In fact, uh, uh, one part of our, uh, of our uh, department that I have not yet touched on, uh, which uh, is just as important as anything, is the Economic Development Administration. Mm -hmm. And EDA, uh, uh, it works with state and local economic development organizations uh, and puts out uh, just a ton of, of uh, grants to support economic development. One of the things that we had uh, coming out of the American Rescue Plan, $3 billion worth of grants focused on local communities. And part of our, our focus is a $1 billion Build Back Better regional challenge where we're asking regions to apply for this funding to transform their local economies. And equity has to be at the core of it. And we've asked these organizations to make sure that they include CDFIs because we know that CDFIs deliver for communities in ways that, frankly, other financial institutions aren't able uh, in, in, in those hardest hit and, and, uh, and least served communities. So we spend a lot of time thinking about CDFIs and partnering with CDFIs. And, and uh, Bill, you know where I am on this. We're going to find new ways uh, to, to partner with CDFIs across the country. Uh, I next have a, a student question. Um, Secretary Graves, how do international trade and international relations factor into discussions of rebuilding an equitable economy? Really great, great question. And the, the thing about the, the Commerce Department is I, I think, I dare say we are the only uh, department in the federal government that touches everything. Um, so you've heard about our work uh, domestically and on, uh, on economic issues uh, domestically. We're also a department that focuses on uh, international issues, foreign policy and national security, uh, particularly our, uh, our bureaus, uh, the Bureau of Industry and Security and the International Trade Administration. So, uh, so that question is, uh, is particularly important as we've seen what's happened over the last few years, the challenges uh, uh, around our supply chain, the retrenchment uh, uh, that we saw uh, over the, the previous four years. Um, we're rebuilding our relationships because we know that it creates great opportunity for our businesses. That when we are engaged uh, bilaterally and multilaterally across the globe, it means that, that, uh, that our people uh, have the opportunity to innovate, to uh, drive uh, economic growth, uh, and that it's that it's again broadly based. So um, we're actually. Uh, uh, you may have heard that, that President Biden uh, is very focused on his Build Back Better World effort that is building on top of our Build Back Better uh, strategy here in the in the United States, and that's an effort to work with our partners, the G uh, the G seven in particular, um, to uh, to drive investment in uh, in the developing world in uh, uh, low and, and middle income countries all, all across the globe. Um, it's finding ways that we can help them invest in their infrastructure, uh, uh, build uh, their economies in partnership with us, creating linkages. The International Trade Administration is doing this on a daily basis, linkages between our businesses, particularly our small and mid-sized enterprises with businesses in those countries. And that the ITA on a daily basis does this work, not just abroad, but we have our, our centers here in the United States that create those direct linkages, our US Export Assistance Centers, the work that we're doing with Select USA to bring in uh, uh, foreign direct investment in the US. So we can rebuild our relationships around the globe, strengthen our relationships, uh, lead with our values uh, and, and, and principles, and do it in a way that actually makes our economy uh, stronger for the long run. We've got another um, question from the audience. Um, 
combating systemic racism will require significant collaboration with the private sector. While there are obviously win-win scenarios that reduce systemic racism, there may be other ones that require tough trade-offs. How do you discuss these topics with the private sector? Well, this is the good thing. Um, we have conversations with the private sector every day. Uh, uh, and and um, I've, I'm empowered by the, by the president, as is the, the secretary, to be very frank and, and open with companies. There are a lot of things that we can do together. And we're going to, as I said to the previous question, we're going to lead with our, with our values and our principles. And uh, we're, we think that, that in the long run, uh, the, the ability to, uh, to re remove those barriers and, and eliminate systemic racism will work out for the companies just as much as it does for our, our workforce. Um, we also want to highlight uh, those companies that uh, that are doing a good job. In fact, we're working with the uh, with the Malcolm Baldrige team that uh, that uh, does the the Baldrige Awards that that focus on on the best practices around innovation, corporate practices, to highlight those companies that are driving diversity and equity internally and with the work that they're doing. Of course, there are there are times where some companies are uh, perhaps not doing the things that, that they should do and, and, uh, and are uh, operating uh, uh, illegally or, or otherwise. And of course, uh, we leave it to the, the regulators and, and to our partners at, at the Department of Justice to do the things that they need to do. But we're really gonna uh, make sure that we, that we promote uh, the, 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 the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's something that that uh, it's pushing on on a very open door so far. Folks want to do the things that, that they can do internally. Um, we've been working with the SEC. We've been working with the FTC uh, about ways that we, again, lift up best practices, that we identify standards that the private sector can use uh, uh, to measure and evaluate uh, what they're doing in terms of, of inclusion uh, and uh, and their internal hiring practices, uh, et cetera, and, and, and investments in, uh, in smaller businesses and minority businesses. All these sorts of, uh, of, of efforts, I think, are, are making a, a difference. Uh, and, and, but there's going to be a, a lot more work that needs to be done on that front. Secretary Graves, you have another friend who's listening in. Uh, Carrie Duggan writes, what lessons from your work under President Obama in Detroit inform your approach in your current role? Well, that's a great question. Uh, thanks for, for uh, listening uh, or, or watching, Carrie, an, an, another uh, great uh, graduate of the uh, University of Michigan, Go Blue. Um, uh, I'll, uh, it, it, the work that we did in Detroit uh, at least from the federal side, was groundbreaking. It was it was the culmination of what uh, the the uh, admin, the Obama administration had been doing in sort of smaller ways uh, up until we got to Detroit. But you'll recall that uh, a, a lot of folks there, I'm sure, will recall Detroit was going through the types of challenges that that no American city had really uh, seen before. There were a few other instances of bankruptcy, but but for, for decades, it wasn't just the, the Great Recession, but for decades, uh, Detroit had been having uh, real challenges, losing 250,000 people over the course of a decade. Um, uh, the, the, the blighted homes, tens of thousands of blighted homes, I think it was 60 plus thousand uh, blighted homes. The streetlights, uh, somewhere around uh, 80,000 streetlights were, were uh, uh, inoperative. Uh, those were our massive challenges for a city that had also lost uh, a lot of its expertise. And, and what we were able to do in close partnership with the mayor, uh, who's, a, who's a dear friend, uh, Mayor Duggan, uh, and, with the, uh, and with leaders all across the city was first off to listen. We learned that it was important not to come in with our prescription, but to understand what people wanted, what the community was saying so that we could address those challenges and find new solutions, but then to have a whole of government approach. And this is something that, that you know, the, the president asked, then President Obama asked, then 
Vice President uh, Biden to, to lead these efforts. It was, a, it was a whole of government approach, bringing all the different departments together to work collaboratively. And that's essentially what we're trying to do now. The president is, has done this with, uh, with our infrastructure law, but in a range of different ways, we're taking a, a much more collaborative approach because the American people don't think about necessarily the Census Bureau or the, or the Minority Business Development Agency or the Federal Highway Administration. They say, the federal government, what can you do for me? So we have to meet people where they are and deliver results to them uh, with our expertise across all of government. Thanks very much. I know we're almost out of time. You've got a crazy busy schedule today. I, I thought I might ask one last question, uh, really on behalf of our students, which is when you're thinking about where our students are when they're coming out of school, the, the um, perspective they might have, how can they navigate their own path towards advancing the public good? Well, uh, I will try and give a, a, a brief answer. Um, uh, because this is this is something that's personal to me because I've, it's sort of driven my career. Um, first off, I go back to that point of being connected to people and communities. You mm -hmm. always have to, if, if you're doing a job in public service, public policy, um, you have to make sure that you're connected to people and communities uh, you're purporting to serve. So that's that's at the at the core of this. Um, the other thing is to remember that your career is going to take a lot of twists and turns. If, if you had told me even 15 years ago, that 10, 10 years ago, that I would be sitting here as the deputy secretary of the U.S. Department of Commerce, I would tell you that you were smoking something. Um, but you just never know which direction your life is going to go. And the key is making sure you hold on to your hopes and dreams and your principles. Don't ever give up your principles. Even if you take a job that you think is not a, will not be directly uh, affecting the, the things that you care the most about, remember that, that there are other ways to, to stay connected. You could serve on the board of an organization. You could volunteer in an area that, uh, that really drives you. But you're gonna find over the course of your career that, that opportunities will present themselves that you would never have imagined uh, popping up that will take you back to where you want it to be at, 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 at that's sort of at the center of who you are. And then something that that uh, a former boss of mine once said that that has really driven me uh, throughout my career. You have to have and this and I should say this, it's, it's a direct connection to the Commerce Department. Uh, my boss and I were friends with former Secretary Ron Brown who unfortunately perished uh, when his plane uh, crashed uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe uh, uh, almost 30 years ago okay. now. Um, and uh, we were actually supposed to be on that trip. So it was sort of personal. And, and he was actually giving a speech uh, to examiners at the Office of the Comptroller of, of the Currency that day when we got the news. And he changed his entire speech around and, and he said to the examiners, he said, you have to have a sense of urgency about that which you were called to do because life and times are tenuous. And it, it, you know, it, it hit home. But over the course of my career, I didn't realize just how important that particular uh, comment was. We never know how much time we're going to have on on this earth. And so if you, if you feel something, if you feel called to doing this work, make sure that you're finding ways to do it. Again, you don't have to have that as the core of whatever job you're doing, but make sure that you're finding other ways to do it. You're staying connected to those things that are most important to you, that drive who you are, that, that, that make up your core values. Um, because you just never know uh, if if you're you're going to have from one day to another, if you're going to have the chance to to make any meaningful impact in that that arena, so for me that's if there's one takeaway, it's it's go go get it, uh, keep keep your values, your principles uh, at the core of who you are, and and remember that urgency. Thanks so much, Secretary Graves. Uh, just a delightful conversation, a great way to end with uh, personal and I think compelling advice. 
thanks to all of us, uh, all of you who are listening today to celebrate Martin Luther King Day with us here at the University of Michigan at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. And uh, for everyone from the University of Michigan, go blue. Take care, Secretary Graves. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Dean Barr. Good to be here.